We just had a wonderful first keynote from a policy maker. Yesterday I remember someone was asking why do we have some presence of partnership with the private sector? And here we are with our second keynote. We're very fortunate to have Dr. Ed Chi from Google Research. Uh, Ed is a research scientist at Google, um, but until very recently, he was the area manager and principal scientist at Palo Alto Research Center's Omantic Social Cognition Group. I'm not going to introduce further because there's, time is running out, but I think um, I have great uh, anticipation and I'm very glad that Ed is able to join us today because his daughter is having his, her first birthday today. So, and it was very lucky that I worked out in terms of, because, thanks to the time zone difference, he could still finish the keynote and then fly home before gaining three hours, okay? So, without further ado, I look forward to hearing what Ed has to say that we can learn from the work that he has done at the industries. Thank you. So it's a, my, uh, my pleasure to be here and still be able to make the birthday party. Uh, so my suitcase is actually on the right hand side there. So I'm unfortunately going to have to run and catch at 11.30 after the keynote, but I do hope to talk, some, talk to some of you um, afterwards. Um, I want to start out this, this talk um, by giving you two very quick stories. The first is this picture. How many of you recognize what this is? Okay. So most of you will probably say that's an Apple IIe, but in fact it is what is called an orange, uh, which was a cologne that was made by a Canadian company um, back in, I think, around 1982, 1983 or so. This was my first computer. Uh, I'm the product of the field that was back then known as Computer Assisted Instruction, also known as CAI. And uh, so it's interesting. Many of you can probably tell that I'm fairly young. I'm 38 this year. And uh, so I'm just around that age where um, I was the product and the beneficiary of the first computer assisted instruction uh, movement uh, that was the predecessor to this conference. Um, and what's interesting about that is, of course, personal computing in a way has become part of my life uh, since I was about 10 years old. And uh, the way in which it has intertwined in my life and in many of our lives. Uh, is really quite deeply personal and very intimate. I want to share with you um, the second story. Uh, is an email that I received uh, about almost five years ago now. Um, in 2007, just before I was married, two weeks to be precise, uh, my future father-in-law was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, I don't know how many of you know about pancreatic cancer, but it is uh, probably the deadliest form of cancer possible. Um, the five-year survival rate is 5%. Um, in other words, one out of 20 people make it uh, in, uh, at the end of the five years. And as a scientist, of course, I started using all, everything that I know about computers and how to access information to learn about this disease. Um, in, at the same time, while we were trying to make decisions about whether the wedding should continue and all these kinds of things, and what are the treatment options. I received this email about a month or two after that uh, from a person I have never met. His name was Brad Bearish, a computer programmer in LA, 
And he said, hey, Ed, I'm a, a fellow Delicious user. I also use book, uh, social bookmarking. I noticed that you bookmark a lot of information about pancreatic cancer. I'm home with my dad who was diagnosed with, uh, over, a little over a year ago, and then it's at the end of things. Um, I've learned a lot through this process. If there's anything you want to ask, I'm here. I'm ready to answer any questions. Uh, and, but just wanted to drop you an email. What was interesting about this was that for those of you who use Delicious, probably know that there's nothing on there that says, you know, here's my email address. So what this guy did was he sort of paid attention to what other people are bookmarking pancreatic cancer stuff, tags, and then looked up what their name was, and then actually did probably a Google search. Luckily, I'm fairly easy to find on Google. I mean, type in Ed Chi, I'm pretty much the first one that comes up. Uh, but he went through all that trouble to find out my email address, and then spending probably about five minutes writing this email and sending it to me, with no expectation of getting any reply back whatsoever. Right? And just, but what does he know? Maybe if it, I was just a student researching for a research paper. But he was willing to reach out. And what, this was right before I started doing all this research I'm about to tell you. And this deeply personal story for me is interesting to, for me to start realizing how much learning on the web now is shared and is social and is collaborative. Sometimes it's synchronous, sometimes asynchronous. And so that's what I want to tell you about in three parts. The talk is going to be in three acts, hopefully each one taking roughly about seven to ten minutes or so. The first one I want to tell you about is the invisible social signal and how it applies in social search. The second part I want to tell you about the visible signals, particularly in the shared annotation system. And the third part I will tell you a little bit about a shared knowledge space and an abstracted uh, uh, knowledge space we, we all know as Wikipedia. So, the first act, the first part. Invisible social signals from, from the crowd. As I just told you this story about Delicious, um, what's really interesting about it is that um, when you start thinking about wanting to analyze this social tagging space, it's really quite difficult to sort of use some sort of method that makes sense uh, immediately. You have people who are reading these documents. These documents are about a certain topic, like for example, pancreatic cancer. And then you need to write down some, uh, you need to start formulating cognitively in your brain the concepts that are in these documents. And what you're basically doing when you're saying, I want to remember this document, is you're doing this sort of encoding act where you say pancreatic cancer. These are two separate concepts. I'm going to write them down as tags. And then three months later, or maybe it's even somebody else, is going to type in hopefully the same keyword, pancreatic cancer, not pancreas. Right? So we have all the usual language morphology issues. And it's also oftentimes three, uh, three months later. So did I use the word cancer or cancers? Did I use the word treatment or something else? Symptoms, for example. So this decoding act of, react, uh, of trying to recall the information that you re recorded, whether it's for yourself or for somebody else, essentially is a decoding step. And memory, unfortunately, is a common human fallacy, um, often. Uh, I don't remember where I put my keys and or where I'm getting old enough at least where I sometimes don't remember where I put my glasses. So this noisy process creates a, a problem for us in, the, in, in memory. And when you start couching social tagging in this form, you realize, oh, that's information theory, right? We can use Klaus Shannon's ideas to actually analyze the system. Well, it turns out that we did that. We went and downloaded about 150 million bookmarks from Delicious. And then we started plotting, doing all these kind of statistical linguistic analysis using information theory. And what we find is that um, here on the left-hand side, we have the entropy of the tag, the distribution of tags inside of the system is actually increasing. So for those of you who may not actually remember information theory from your probably, uh, probabilistic uh, theory classes, uh, entropy is the measure of uncertainty. Uh, and if, even if that's too abstract, we're just mere half an hour away from 
uh, Macau, where a lot of people gamble, right? So uncertainty actually is tied to gambling. Essentially, it's your ability to guess what is going to happen, right? So these graphs, even though they seem complex, is actually very simple. What it's saying is that as time goes on on the x-axis, entropy is increasing. In other words, it's getting harder and harder for you to gamble what the next word will be in the system. Let me give you an analogy. If everyone comes to the system, all types in, maybe it's because it's a medical field, everyone types in cancer, right? Then your ability to guess that the next word will be cancer, you would say, oh, I'm willing to put on $100 on that the fact that the next word is going to be cancer. But if on the other hand, it's the entire population, it could be cancer, it could be Java, it could be programming, it could be orange, it could be any word you want to choose. Now you have maximum uncertainty. In that case, you have really high entropy, right? So what these graphs are showing is that over time, actually these social tagging systems increase in uncertainty. It gets harder for you to gamble what the next word will be. In other words, the knowledge that is encoded inside of these systems is getting harder and harder to retrieve because of the entropy, right? And how are people dealing with these, uh, these problems? The way that you're dealing with this problem, ignore the graph on the left-hand side for a second. The graph on the right-hand side is much more interesting, actually. Uh, again, x-axis is time, y-axis is the number of keywords that they're using per bookmark. In other words, they say, if I use the word cancer, in 2004, maybe I'll get 100 results out of the whole system, right? Four years later, fast forward four years later, maybe I'll get a million, right? When the web first started, you wanted to learn about math. There was maybe 10 sites. Now you type in the word math, and it gives you garbage, right? Uh, so by increasing the number of keywords per bookmark, they're fighting back against entropy. It's interesting to think about the way in which these systems are, being, are, are responding uh, to uh, user input in these ways. So our idea was to take these concepts and put it in probabilistic terms and actually build a system for information access. So we have uh, tags on the one side, URL on the other, and we can build these conditional probabilities of saying, given that you're interested in the word cancer, what are the documents that you're interested in? What are the URLs I should retrieve? On the other hand, if I give you a URL, like for example, cscl2001.org or something like that, right? Uh, what are the concepts that you would be interested in? What are the tags that you're interested in? So we essentially end up building this sort of semantic similarity graph. Um, that sort of says tutorial is similar to tips, to the word guide. And it's really interesting to uh, discover user behavior in this data. Um, it turns out, I, at least I didn't know it at the time, that the word tutorial, which is not a real word, tutorial with an R rather than a T, is often associated concept with tutorials because it turns out that R is right next to T. So tutorial is a very common misspelling of tutorials. Uh, and so our system is actually able to allow students to type in tutorial and still get the same results. Um, maybe that's not encouraging good spelling, but at least they get to the knowledge that they want. Uh, so um, here's the system that we built um, called Mr. Taggy. And unfortunately, because I left Park about five months ago, the system is no longer live. But uh, the idea is that you go there and you can type in, for example, uh, interesting science, and here are the results. And you can say, you know, actually I like interesting, I mean cool. I don't mean interesting in other senses. Uh, and I want specifically to learn about physics experiments, for example. And here's one that uh, a lot of people apparently agree is an interesting physics ex experiment, which I actually don't know about, was the pitch drop experiment. And all kinds of other concepts you can put in. So for example, you can say I want to look for beautiful galleries. Um, and specifically, I mean art, but not photography. Um, and so I could actually say no on illustration. Um, I, I don't want anything in the system that has illustrations in it. And here, um, I end up with a bunch of photography stuff instead of illustrations. Um, here, the next one is kind of a good uh, example I really like. 
uh, type in the word fitness, most of the people, the first time that they think of the word fitness, they say, oh, exercise. Actually, an equally important part of fitness is diet. And so you could say, actually, I mean fitness in the sense of diet and nutrition, but not exercise. Maybe I'm a couch potato and I don't want to exercise. Uh, and so I can uh, type, tell the system no on exercise. Here's another example, which is you type in the keyword JFK. Most of the results are on the JFK, the assassination, the conspiracy theories around it. Um, and I can say, no, actually, I mean JFK, not the conspiracy theory, but the airport in New York. Um, and so here the results show that you can take a helicopter from JFK to uh, Manhattan, but uh, what I was looking for was more of the taxi information. So by navigating in these sort of concept spaces, um, the system uses these social tags as cues in the environment to move around. Um, so this was the first example. And given that this is a CSCL conference, I thought I'd present some experimental data. So what we did was we designed this three by two experiment, uh, two interface, but either using this system or the regular sort of Google-like interface, and then three different task domains um, around learning about future architecture, uh, global warming or web mashups. Um, and then we, we brought in 30 subjects into the laboratory um, and do the usual uh, Latin square design. Right? For each domain, the task blocks consist of three parts. They first have to do an easy and a difficult page collection task, going around the system to collect things that are interesting to them in that domain of web mashup or future architecture. And then a second step, which is summarization. They actually have to write a little three or five paragraph essay in 10 minutes about the thing that they just learned. Very classic high school exam kind of, kind of setup. And then the, th the fourth, uh, fourth task they had to do was keyword generation. Given what you have learned so far, generate lots of relevant domain specific keywords. Tell us what you have learned that are important concepts in this space, right? The evaluation result was interesting. Um, what we found was the exploratory interface users actually performed more queries. The interesting thing is that from a HCI and also a, uh, a sort of a, um, a HCI interaction, information access, digital library perspective, performing more query is not a good thing, right? That means the interface is not letting people get to their information as quickly as possible. People also took more time on task. Again, that seems bad, right? I mean, people actually have to spend more time to learn about the, the, interest, uh, the area of interest, right? But here's the interesting. People with the exploratory interface wrote better summaries. That is, their, their um, uh, exam was, was scored higher by a bunch of examiner judges. And they generated more relevant keyword queries. Uh, and through a NASA cognitive load um, instrument, we were able to establish that they had a higher cognitive load. So the interesting thing is that even though they took more time on task, is that they actually learned better. There was evidence of greater learning engagement. Uh, and in the statistics I don't have time to present, what we also found was that this kind of system seems to work better for novices of those domains than experts who know something about future architecture, for example. And so it seems to be a technology that brings equality. We talked a little bit yesterday in policy form about uh, equality of, of information. And it's interesting that this kind of interface actually brings the expertise level somewhat on parity between the novices and the experts. Okay, so part two. Visible social signal from shared highlighting. Okay, so about four or five months ago, I was uh, um, actually looking around for a new job. And so I ended up in Beijing trying to uh, land a job potentially here in mainland China. And um, I arrived similarly to how I arrived uh, this Monday, around six o'clock, and I was starving. I really wanted to get some food. Um, and here on the right-hand side is the, my actual web uh, history from Google history's uh, uh, traces, right? I wanted to find a restaurant, uh, and I ran into somebody in the hallway uh, and said, you want to go to dinner with me? And so I'll find a restaurant. 
So I'll go, go, go back, and the first thing I did at the very bottom here is I went to Baidu, which is a Chinese keyword search engine. Uh, and then I typed in, well, you know, if you're in Beijing and you're in the middle of the winter, what do you eat? Uh, yang rou, which is the, uh, the hot pot, uh, the lamb hot pots, right? So I type in, you know, Beijing uh, hot pot. And what was interesting was I realized I started doing what was essentially social search. I went to uh, all these review sites. Baidu has this thing that's called Baidu uh, Knowledge, or uh, Baidu Zhidao, which is kind of this social Q&A space, just like Yahoo Answers, um, where people say, you know, what is the best you know, hot pot in Beijing? And so I read through a bunch of posting by people who left these re restaurant recommendation uh, behind. And then interestingly, I also went and looked at all the pictures that people have taken of their food. You know, and I was hungry, so I was looking at this food and you know, started drooling. And you can see that I actually looked at quite a few of these pictures to see whether they were any good. And then finally, um, I decided on a place and then um, went to maps and look up where it was and figure out you know, how to get there and all that sort of stuff, right? So what's interesting about here, I took you throughout that task is because when you're a single user, if you didn't have any of these social cues in the system, what you have is a very pure heuristic search, classic AI problem, right? You are on the left-hand side here and trying to get to the target, which is the restaurant, and actually the food, which is very important. Um, and what you're having trouble is actually um, getting to the target, the food. And what you actually want is a very good heuristic like the way I just illustrated, these pictures, uh, these reviews that people left behind, right? So it seems clear that collaborative search or social search could offer these collaborative hints um, for, for food finding. <laughs> um, but of course, it could be applied uh, for learning as well. So this was the kind of inspiration that uh, took us to build this other system called Spartacus. The idea was that uh, when you're reading web pages, perhaps what you want to do is leave behind some traces of the places that you thought were the most interesting. So here, um, in three different colors, is three different people's traces of what they thought was interesting about this web page. And this was a little plugin that we had designed for Firefox, where your normal just kind of um, click and drag uh, interface um, enables the sort of the highlighting of the most Im important parts of the, uh, of the web page. And the system actually aggregates all these paragraphs together into what we call a shared notebook, where if a person is a friend of yours on the system, then you actually see all the paragraphs that they have been reading and what parts of the paragraph that they found interesting. And then on the right-hand side, you get this little uh, tag cloud, giving you a sense of the kinds of things that this person has paid attention to. So you can see here, I've shown you that, you know, highlighting, because we're actually eating our own dog food, using the system to learn about, you know, highlighting research that are available out there um, on the net. So the idea is shared uh, notebooking, shared highlighting, and in situ tagging while you're in the middle of the task. What's interesting about this was that it turns out that we hypothesized the uh, interesting part of the system was in two parts. One is for, your, for yourself, as sort of in the case of social tagging, you might go back to the same system to remember sort of, I remember coming back to this, uh, coming to this web page. What was the part I was interested in, right? So that's the recall task where you're trying to figure out what was the paragraph that I got that idea from, right? So that's the recall task. The interesting thing is that in a shared notebook uh, uh, situation, you could also have essentially a first visit experience. Maybe someone says, I've been to this web page and it's really interesting because it really relates to uh, uh, the project that we're working on, on this highlighting project, for example. So they go to this web page and it shows you in a different color other than your own, which is always in yellow, someone else's uh, idea about what was interesting on this page. So you can sort of very quickly perhaps use their traces that be, they've left behind as a, uh, a cue about which part of the pay, web page to actually pay attention to. Okay, again, I'm going to show you some evaluation very quickly. 
we decided to use a sense-making task again, learning about a domain area like Enterprise 2.0 Mashup. We, we uh, wanted people to actually learn about this uh, area and then actually write two essays. And then again, we're going to grade these essays for quality, etc. And we're going to see, the, the problem with this, doing this kind of research is of course, you actually need a group of people to have actually created the knowledge, the, the, the traces for other people to use, right? Um, we skipped that step and decided to stimulate uh, what a bunch of experts might leave behind as traces. So we decided to use tags from Delicious, which are actual user traces, as a proxy for what a real user might have done. And we chose URLs based upon whether they were high in Google PageRank. And then we constructed through these combination of these two things, a simulated shared notebook um, that's available for the uh, users to, uh, to peruse. And then our performance measure is a classic learning, a relative learning gain uh, uh, measure. So we have a pretest and a post-knowledge test. And the learning gain is the maximum possible uh, gain that you can have, which is the max score, let's say 20 or 100, minus what was the pre-knowledge. Let's say you got, you know, five out of the 20 questions right, right? So 20 minus five is 15. Your maximum possible gain is 15. And then your post score uh, minus the pre-score, which is how much you actually learned uh, during this period, right? And then um, subtracted uh, as a relative learning gain. The procedure was simple. You were either placed into within subject three different conditions, the pretest and the demographic um, pretest. Then you're put into one of three conditions. Uh, either you didn't have the access to the system, or you had access to the system, but only for yourself, or you had access to the system with this simulated expert notebook that's available to you, we can, which you can choose to use or you can ignore it. And then we do a post-test at the end to see how much learning you got. Here were the results. We had 18 subjects that come into our lab to do this fairly painful <laughs> uh, uh, laboratory study. And it turns out that the Spartacus and the friend, that is the SF condition, the last one I told you about, had a 45% learning gain. And that was over on top of uh, the uh, Spartacus on only and the Spartacus, uh, no Spartacus, that is you having no notebook whatsoever. So what's interesting here is that although it's not statistically significant, the difference between the first two bars, that is the two control conditions, but uh, there is a significant difference uh, on the last condition. So that's the, and what, you might be wondering, why is it that with, with uh, the solo highlighting interface, users actually did worse. The reason is because note taking takes time. It costs you time to actually do that. So it's not entirely clear actually from this experiment that note taking is actually an effective learning strategy. There's all, as many of you know, the, the, perhaps you're an educational psychologist, the whole, the whole issue around uh, encoding of knowledge, whether it's you know, during reading or whether doing note taking, et cetera. At least this experiment suggests that note taking is not necessarily an effective strategy. What is interesting is the access to the previous people who have come before you. So I guess in a way th this very small experiment sort of points to the promise of social learning. Right, that solo, solo learning with note taking is actually not necessarily good, but shared learning, social learning, um, is very effective. What we also did, this looks really complicated, but I mean, you only have to pay attention to two colors on this slide. Pink, which is uh, people who actually accessed the shared notebook, which of course, uh, the, the notebook that is in the system, right? So. Uh, in the third condition, which is the SF condition at the very top, you'll see that a lot of access in pink at the front of the task where people use the shared notebook to sort of say, what are the URLs I should be paying attention to if I wanted to learn about enterprise 2.0 uh, uh, mashups? The other color that you want to pay attention to is yellow, which is W, stands for Wikipedia. What's very interesting in this chart is that all these students 
used Wikipedia to start out in their task in understanding the domain. And as the task went on, the use of Wikipedia became less. As they learn about a domain and they have a structure, in sort of in the PAJ tradition, if you will, that once they had the schema for understanding, they can move away from uh, needing that as a crutch to understand the space. Um, so there's some interesting structure in the way that they, they actually carried out their task. Um, and so this front part, where in the SF condition, where they have this shared notebook, it's quite clear that this shared notebook plus Wikipedia was a very effective strategy. One note of caution, though, is that there's something called the isolation effect, which is the von Rostroff effect, that was actually published all the way back in 1933 that said anything that you basically highlight or you call out as difference, of course it's going to be the thing that people are going to pay attention to. It turns out that there's all this really interesting research um, by Nissen, uh, Hogarty, as well as Silvers uh, and others, who's shown that the appropriateness of highlighting, that is, if I gave you a shared notebook that was terrible in its selection of URLs, in its selection of what part of the paragraph to pay attention to, you will probably do worse, right? So our challenge is getting that nice shared notebook um, to the user, okay? So I'm gonna try and finish up in about 10 minutes. I hope that's okay, okay. So part three the shared uh, knowledge in Wikipedia. I want to tell you a little bit about the science of understanding a shared knowledge space that we've been doing. And of course, there are members of this audience, Gary Stahl among others, who have been pioneers in this space. Roy, Roy P. at uh, uh, Northwestern did a lot of interesting work in this space back in uh, the 80s and, and 90s. Um, but what's interesting is that I think uh, Wikipedia is a, such an interesting space for us to study from a big science, little science sense. And so let me explain what I mean by that. Here's a standard chart about Wikipedia and its exponential growth. The x-axis is time from about 2001, which is the beginning of history for Wikipedia, to about uh, 2007. And uh, you can s the y-axis is the number of articles in Wikipedia, and it's in logarithmic scale. Um, the only uh, similarity I have with uh, the previous commenters uh, is that the Richter scale is also on the logarithmic scale. <laughs> um, so every you know, bump in one unit is actually a tenfold increase in the number of articles uh, in Wikipedia. So you can see that as a sheer knowledge space, it struggled in the beginning for about a year and a half, it was trying to get on this exponential train. But once it got there, it stuck to it like a, like a you know, the, the high-speed train between Beijing and, and Shanghai. Right? It went, it took off, and uh, stayed with this exponen exponential growth. What's interesting about this is that from digital library and other library sciences before this, in the 50s and 60s, we knew that this kind of exponential growth was very common, actually, in libraries. And no matter where you looked, in terms of the number of edits, not the number of articles, number of edits to the, to the site, that's growing exponentially. But what was interesting was something happened in March 2007 that was unexpected. Remember what I said about entropy and gambling. If you were in Macau and someone said, looking at this chart, I want you to predict what would happen a year later in March of 2008. You'd probably get out a ruler and you say, okay, you know, I predict somewhere up. Uh, in the uh, uh, 7 million, 8 million range, right? And you put down $100 for it. But this was actually what happened uh, after March 2007. And this was also robust. It didn't matter how you measured. Uh, in the number of editors, again, it looked like it was exponential. Classic digital library growth model. And then what we got instead after March 2007 was a falling off of the bandwagon, if you will, um, and getting off the exponential train. So what was happening? Here we have this poster child of success um, on Web 2.0, and it was not working, right? And um, what was interesting about this is the conventional wisdom in March 2007 was that Wikipedia had what we call the rich get richer effect, which is, you know, if you have $100, it's quite easy to make the next $100. But if you have only $1, 
it's quite difficult to make the next 100, right? And that makes sense um, because we all know how money works, right? It's easier to make money when you have money. And Wikipedia is the same way. If that's the place where everyone is paying attention, if all those students that I just talked about use Wikipedia as the structure, the schema to learn about a space, then that's the place where they hopefully will also contribute back. Even though I know for many years, the academics among us, myself included, um, often told people, don't use Wikipedia because anybody can write anything they want on Wikipedia. So you know that the information is not so good there, right? Well, it turns out that our students are going to use it no matter what we say. So um, I've always been given uh, the advice that for every equation you put on a slide, you lose half of the audience. So don't fret. Just as the way that I taught you information theory, I'm going to teach you differential uh, calculus. Okay? So I said preferential attachments edit get edits. That's what's known as exponential growth model. And it's described by this equation on the, right hand, uh, on the left hand side. N is the number of the, the population, the size of the population. What this equation says is that the growth rate depends on two variables. The size of the current population, that is the number of article in the system, and the growth rate of that population. So in other words, the difference on the left-hand side, the difference in the population divided by time, by a unit time, is equal to the product between the growth rate and the current population. In other words, um, if you have a lot of rabbits, it's easy to make the next 100 rabbits. But if you only have two rabbits, then you only get to produce a certain number of offspring, right? So R times N. And if you were to solve for this differential equation, what you end up with uh, is a graph that looks like that, which fits with what we just saw. Instead, it turns out that what the data that we just saw looks more like a, what we call a logistic growth model, which is the R times N is modified by this term that we call carrying capacity, which is named K. The idea that Wikipedia perhaps will probably grow to about 3.5 to 4 million articles and stop growing because it becomes harder for you to find the next article to edit. And so you, if you solve for that equation, you get this, this curve that looks like this. And it turns out that this model that we proposed in a paper in Wikisim uh, two years ago fits the data. So if you plot the differential equation, the real data, which is in dark blue here, and the predictions that are in uh, cyan color, which is, corresponds to 3.5 million, 4 million, and 4.5 million, the curve somewhat fits. And it suggests that Wikipedia is in this logistic growth curve. And what's interesting about that is that this discovery that we published was done on the, uh, at the anniversary of Darwin's um, e uh, exploration around uh, the struggle for existence, natural selection. Biological system, as the competition increases, um, increases the competition inside the system, and what we get is increasing patterns of conflict and dominance. So it turns out that this logistic growth model actually fits much better the kinds of system that we have. So as I understand, I'm starting to run out of time, so I'm going to skip over some of the next couple of slides. So I'm just going to entice you with the pictures. Um, and skip forward to, to this slide, which is interesting because for those of you who were paying attention, you probably are actually a little bit offended by the modeling that I just showed you because the idea that Wikipedia will get to 4 million articles and knowledge will stop growing, it's just plainly offensive to academics, I think. I mean, what about, how are we going to cover new artists like Lady Gaga? If, uh, you know, she surely deserves a new Wikipedia entry, right? Knowledge is always growing, so how is it that possible that I'm standing up here to tell you that Wikipedia is going to get to 4 million no more? So actually, we think the real model is that we're getting off the exponential train and onto the linear train. So this is what we think the real model should look like, that in the beginning we have this sort of exponential growth and then we're getting onto much more linear uh, part of our existence in Wikipedia. Okay, so I'm going to close off in about an, a minute or so because I actually have a flight to catch in 20 minutes. <laughs> uh, so what did we learn? 
The common thread that I told you about is social signals. The utilization of social signals for learning and information access. Whether it's the invisible kind where you're using a system and it's not clear that the signal is from the crowd, the visible and the abstracted like in Wikipedia. And what's interesting here is that the establishment of this common ground happens through a variety of social processes. Some of it is in implicit coordination in social tagging. It wasn't like we got all the social taggers in the same room here and we said, okay, we're all gonna use the keyword CSCL 2011 without the space in it, right? People wanna, they could use cancers, they could use pancreas, they can use all kinds of words, pancreatic if they wanted to. This implicit coordination of words, the explicit coordination that happened in the shared notebook that I told you about, and then the negotiation that happened, the story I didn't get to tell you about, how do we decide whether an Italian invented a radio or an American invented a radio in Wikipedia. The negotiation of the common ground there. And what's interesting here is that the, the Stanford professor, Herbert Clark, um, who talked about how collective action requires common ground and its accumulation over time. It's very appropriate here. Um, I think that's the common thread that I, my research, I think, is, has with CSCL conference attendees, is that we're all working on this problem together. The research vision that we have is that this augmented social cognition, the idea that cognition is the ability to remember, think, and reason, and that social cognition is the ability of a group of people to do this, and the augmented part, which is how do you use machinery to do this. So in other words, going from this, which is actually my real junior high school in Taiwan, I existed in an environment like this, where I was probably one of the bored students in the picture here, to this, engagement and interaction. So I hope that is of sufficient inspiration for you for the next couple of days. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot be here for the reason that I have described earlier. But thank you very much for your time. I hope this was interesting to you. Thank you. So may I now call upon Professor Pierre Dillenburg from EPFL of Sweden to give his response. Short response. Short response. Uh, this is a really, really smart guy. He doesn't know this community, and he managed to give a talk that reconciliates the kind of two parts of CSCL. In CSCL, there is one part which is about communities, informal learning, and so on one part which is more about schools, formal education. So the first part, it was well illustrated at the beginning, tags of cl uh, clouds of tags, you know, the knowledge is in the cloud. We learn physics because we have a friend on Facebook who knows, who is a Nobel Prize in physics. So if we share our kids' picture on Facebook, I will learn quantum physics by being friend of, okay. You understand that's not really my part of CSL. And then the second part of CSL, which is more about formal education. And here, you manage to do the two. You have this first part where you have 150 millions of tags, and then you come to pre-test, post-test, learning gains, which is the second part. And there, I was quite pleased that you can reconcile these two parts in your talk. But there was, there was an issue there. In the first experiment and in the second experiment, they learn significantly in some conditions. But why do they learn? Is it because of all the tagging behavior? In the first experiment, they have to write a summary. And writing a summary, that's really a challenging, difficult task. Much more difficult than tagging or reading annotations from other. In the second experiment, they have to write an essay. The same thing. By the way, I was very pleased that you found that uh, the increased learning occur at the same time as the increased cognitive load. Uh, there is no learning with no cognitive load. I would like to stay on your chair, Paul. Uh, I would like to repeat this here. So. So in some way, you, there is a gap in the two parts, I would say, of the explanation. One is the social tagging things, and one is a very formal experiment when you prove learning. But the, there is something hidden there, which is its intense activity that they do. It's not only the tagging or reading the tags of others. It's, it's pro, you know, processing heavily uh, information uh, by writing something. 
which is kind of maybe explaining more the learning outcomes that the tagging activity per se. So um, I should stop. Okay, I stop. Let's invite our guests up, and uh, Professor Nancy Law will present a souvenir to uh, Ed Chi. So uh, I hope you enjoyed this morning as much as I did. And unfortunately, we are running out of time, so there's no, absolutely no chance for any questions. But, um, but still, I mean, I would hope, now you, the rest of the conference would not be here anymore. So you, we all have to move up to the main library extension. Um, I propose that we have a shortened 20 minute break. Okay, so that means we will have a uh, our lunch time shortened by 10 minutes, okay? So enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>